So in my last video, I introduced my sliding model for protein intake, where the leaner you are, the closer you should be to 1.6, and the more body fat you have, the closer you should be to 1.2 grams per pound of lean body mass. Now I was scrolling through the comments on this video in bed the other night, and I realized a nice few people had a problem with these recommendations. A few people even said, it's got to be a typo. So in this video, I wanna set the record straight about protein, how much do you really need? And if the data suggests that eating just 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, or just over 0 0.7, yes, 0 0.7 grams per pound, then why on earth am I using figures as high as 1.6? Well, let's clear something up first. If you guys look closely, you'll see three letters next to my protein figures, L, B, and M. This means that unlike recommendations we're used to hearing online, I'm using grams per pound of lean body mass, not total body weight. So the most popular recommendation, good old one gram per pound of body weight, would mean that if I weigh 165 pounds, I should eat 165 grams of protein per day. Simple. However, when using lean body mass, I need to subtract my fat mass first. So if I'm currently 10% body fat, I'd wanna subtract 10% of my total body weight to figure out my lean body mass, 148 pounds. And because I'm on the leaner side, I'd multiply that by 1.5, give me a daily protein intake of 223 grams per day, which we can round up to 225. So hopefully that clarifies how the sliding protein model actually works. Um, but even apart from that misunderstanding, some people still think that these recommendations are way too high. After all, they have me eating 225 grams of protein a day, which is admittedly a lot for a guy my weight. So next I wanna refute the top two arguments I've been hearing for why some people think you should eat lower than what I'm suggesting. The first and worst argument is that a high protein intake isn't safe. So a high protein diet is actually bad for your kidneys and your bones. Well, this just isn't true. While it is correct that a high protein diet can worsen kidney function in patients already with kidney disease, a brand new meta-analysis looking at 28 studies further confirms that high protein intakes do not adversely influence kidney function in healthy adults. And the same thing goes for bone health. Meta-analyses all consistently find that a high protein intake is, if anything, slightly favorable for bone health and certainly not detrimental. The second most common argument is that the scientific literature simply shows that a much lower intake is plenty for maximizing muscle growth. So the latest data shows that 0.72 grams per pound is sufficient efficient and I actually have the study right here. You can see. All right, so let's dig into the research on this one. In particular, I want to focus on three studies investigating protein intake. A 2017 paper that recommended 0.7 grams per pound, a 2018 paper that recommended 0.7 to 1.1 grams per pound, and an earlier 2014 paper recommending 1 to 1.4 grams per pound of fat-free mass. Now let's start with this 2017 meta-analysis from Morton and colleagues, which found that intakes above 1.6 grams per kilogram, so 0.72 grams per pound, don't offer any extra benefit when it comes to muscle growth. However, most of the studies in this analysis were on untrained subjects, and of the few studies that did use weight training, none of the subjects were in a caloric deficit or trying to lose fat. So while this paper does provide a sufficient intake for those merely looking to build muscle while in a caloric surplus, it might not be most appropriate for those seeking body recomposition, where we're also concerned about losing fat or at least lowering body fat percentage as we build muscle. Next, let's turn to this review from Hector and Phillips, published the following year, which really highlights the fact that the leaner you are and the more training experience you have, the more you can benefit from higher protein. And when laying out their recommendations for elite athletes, they put the 1.6 gram per kilo figure from the previous study at the low end of their range, and then going as high as 2.4 grams per kilo, or just about 1.1 grams per pound. Uh, so this paper does lend some support to the trusty old one gram per pound of body weight rule. And I think that actually makes it a pretty good rule of thumb. It's super easy to remember. The math couldn't be simpler. And if anything, it probably overestimates how much protein most people really need, which I see as a good thing. However, I still think this rule is a bit too reductionistic to apply to everyone. For example, it would have someone weighing 300 pounds at 30% body fat, eating 300 grams of protein a day, which is definitely overkill since their lean mass is just over 200 pounds. So because basing protein intake off body weight alone starts to break down at the extremes, I prefer the recommendations laid out in this 2014 systematic review from Helms and colleagues, which not only used fat-free mass to determine protein guidelines, but also restricted its analysis to lean, trained individuals in a caloric deficit. And because this study was set toward preserving muscle while losing fat, 
I think this is the most relevant paper to those seeking body recomposition. And the researchers recommended consuming up to 3.1 grams per kilogram of fat-free mass, or just about 1.4 grams per pound of fat-free mass, which falls right in the middle of the 1.2 to 1.6 range that I laid out at the beginning of the video. Now, some people still might be thinking, well, if the Helms paper set its upper end at 1.4, why bother going all the way up to 1.6 at all? Why not cap the sliding model out at 1.4? Well, I do have a good reason for that. Like I said earlier, the Helms paper was focused on dieting individuals eating in a caloric deficit, meaning their calories were quite limited. Now, the issue with having limited calories is that if you keep raising protein higher and higher, you'll have to keep dropping fats and carbs lower and lower. And this can pose a few problems. If fats get too low, anabolic hormones get suppressed, and if carbs get too low, training performance drops. So in a caloric deficit, there's a balancing act. You need to eat enough protein to spare muscle mass, but not so much that carbs or fats get displaced. Now we can contrast this with body recomposition, where calories really aren't that limited. Typically we're eating at or around maintenance intake. So in this context, we really have nothing to lose by going a bit higher, and there could be something to gain. Now, I have a hypothesis that very high protein diets are simply better at causing body recomposition. Now in support of this, I wanna read one of the concluding remarks from a 2015 study out of Jose Antonio's lab, which went higher on protein than any study we've looked at so far, and even a bit higher than my own sliding model at 3.4 grams per kilogram, or just over 1.5 grams per pound of body weight. They said, this study, as well as previous work from our lab, suggests that gains in body fat are unlikely to occur with protein overfeeding. And I would see that alone as a major plus for body recomposition when we're trying to limit fat gain as much as possible. Now, other coaches in the field have also mirrored my hunch here. In an interview we did way back in 2015, world-renowned natural bodybuilding coach Cliff Wilson told me about how he adjusts protein to minimize fat gain in the off-season. You know, I, I'm actually uh, a little controversial, I guess I would say, in that department. The more scientific-minded coaches, they tend to do along somewhere around a gram per pound of body weight, and then, you know, they'll, they'll bring it up a little bit once the contest prep starts. I actually do the opposite. I go very high in the off season with protein intake because my view is that energy levels are sufficient to fuel hard training. During prep, I will bring protein down to a more moderate level to spare carbohydrates. Now, protein also has a few other benefits from a fat loss perspective. According to one 2008 review, increased satiety from protein has been observed in a single meal over 24 hours and when compared to carbs and fats of the same caloric value. And in pretty much every study on this, protein has about double the thermic effect of carbs and fats, meaning your body burns about twice as many calories digesting protein as it does carbs or fats. And I think all of these factors combine together to make high protein diets much more effective in a recomposition context. Now, with all that said, I will say that my sliding model isn't perfect. First of all, it's meant to apply to body recomposition. And as I've mentioned, these intakes might be excessive in some other contexts. It also does require an extra step of math and you need to estimate your body fat percentage for it to work. Now this can be a bit tricky, but skin calipers are both accessible and surprisingly reliable when used correctly. And there are several visual resources available online that I can link below. Now, of course, you don't need to know your body fat percentage precisely for the scale to work. You just need to be in the right ballpark. Now I was gonna go through this full table of examples, but I think for the sake of time, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that once you've accounted for lean body mass using the sliding model, most protein intakes do in fact cluster around one gram per pound of body weight anyway. And if you'd like a little more clarity on what these intakes look like for people of varying body fat, you can pause here for some more detail on that. And if you guys are looking for a more complete picture of all this stuff, I definitely recommend checking out my new Ultimate Guide to Body Recomposition. And I'll leave some more detail about that in the description box down below. And before we go, I wanna thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that I use to run my own website, jeffnipper.com, where I sell all my training programs and the new nutrition guide. They have aesthetic designer custom templates and 24 hour customer support, which makes the whole process of getting your website up and running very simple. I also find their analytics app really helpful for tracking data like site traffic, popular products, and more. So if you guys are looking to build your own website or your own online store, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com forward slash nippered, and that'll save you 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. So thanks again, guys, so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.